Greetings once again and welcome. It may be a good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you, depending on where you are on the four corners of the world. It's me again, Professor Godo Namo, your course director, wishing you well as you view and listen to this recording. So far, you have, or you should have, gone through the following recordings the post COVID 19 low carbon transition course overview. Module one, introduction to global and African development agenda setting and agendas. And module two, disaster risk reduction under climate change and pandemics. Today, we are on module three, focusing on low carbon, just and sustainability transition in an African context. I hope we are going to enjoy this module as I also enjoyed it when I was preparing it. As for our module outline or what we are going to be covering, we will go to the module learning outcomes, module objectives, concepts and terms in low carbon space, the just and sustainability transitions, low carbon development with a focus on towards net zero, the energy sector as a battlefield towards net zero. And the last section will cover what is it or what is in it for Africa. Then, of course, when you've completed your module, you will be able to undertake that usual quiz where you will be given three chances to uh, answer 10 questions, uh, multiple questions, multiple choice questions that will be uh, loaded on your platform. Now, as to the expected learning outcomes, we are saying at the completion of this module, you as a delegate or as a participant, you should be able to explain the concept and terms in low carbon development. You should be able to discuss the concept and contestations in the just and sustainability transitions discourses or debates. You should be able to evaluate low carbon development strategies and mechanisms. You should also be able to examine the energy sector trends and dynamics up to 2050 and beyond. And lastly, you should be able to analyze the contribution and benefits for Africa within the low carbon development, just and sustainability transition matrix. We have set three objectives in this module. Number one, to understand the concept and policies on low carbon, just and sustainability transition in the context of COVID-19 and climate change, as well as explore the advantages and disadvantages thereof for African economies. To build capacity for low carbon and climate negotiations with the view to promote sustainable African growth that is inclusive of the blue economy. You should also be able to prepare the African continent and key stakeholders for the global transition to net zero by 2015. As for our topics, we'll start with the concept and terms in low carbon space, including fundamentals in that space. We'll also talk about the just and sustainability transitions, con concepts and contestations. We will look at low carbon development towards net zero, and we will also look at the energy sector as a battle zone towards 2050. And lastly, we ask the questions, what is it if that Africa will gain or what is in it for Africa? Let's now move on to the section dealing with our concept and terms in low carbon space. I thought it was prudent for me to start by reminding us or maybe recapping because we want to uh, answer the question, why really talk about this low carbon transition and all other jargons that are there? And I thought it would be necessary for us to recap and understand the climate change, how really climate change takes place and what are the impacts thereof, which is the reason why we have set this course for you. Now, for us to understand climate change, it's important for us to start by talking on the concept of the greenhouse effect. Now, the greenhouse effect. I want you, wherever you are, to imagine. I think some of you have seen these agricultural greenhouses. Imagine them. Actually, some of them are white. When you're in a flight, for those that have been in a flight, I think most of you have been in a flight. 
you see some things that are white with uh, covered with the white plastics as you are lending. And inside there, there are green products being grown. Actually, there, there, there are plants that are being grown in these green houses. These are agricultural greenhouses. So what does an agricultural greenhouse do? Agricultural greenhouses, they trip heat. They also allow sunlight. When the heat is trapped in that particular agricultural greenhouse, it is not allowed to escape. So by so doing, that heat that is trapped within that agricultural greenhouse he has got what we call the greenhouse effect, or it's similar to what the, the, the natural and man-made greenhouse gases we are going to talk about shortly do in the atmosphere. So when the heat is trapped, the adequate sunlight is there, the water is there, the soil is there, the nutrients are there, then the farmer can regulate that heat and there's perfect growth if you so wish. But the main point here is heat is trapped and little of it is allowed to escape. Now, let's come to the issue now of the global warming concept and the greenhouse uh, uh, effect. I also want you to imagine, uh, I think some of you have witnessed this, you, most of us are drivers. When you leave your car in the open and there is heat, even minimal heat, the windows are closed. By the time you come, the inside of that car is so hot. Actually, the sad story is some parents have lost their young ones under such environments or pets as well. So you leave your dog, you leave your kid in the car, you said, let me run and buy a milk for breakfast. Then you get to the shop, you get disturbed, uh, something happens there and you take longer than you expect. And of course the car is trapped in it, the child is stressed, it's stressed, and eventually the child can even die or the pet can even die. So that is actually something similar to what the greenhouse effect does. So the car traps the heat, but it does not allow it to escape. So in a natural uh, uh, environment, we have the sun and we have the earth, we have the earth system, we have the atmospheric system and its circulation. So what happens? The solar is radiated to the Earth's surface. When the solar is radiated to the Earth's surface, the Earth absorbs some of it, and some of it is re-radiated into the atmosphere. But because under natural conditions, the greenhouse uh, gases, we are talking now about the carbon dioxide, the nitrogen, the methane in the atmosphere, uh, forms a thin layer, a much thin layer, that will allow significant amount of heat to be radiated back into the atmosphere and balance out. So under that, without the introduction of human, human beings or the introduction of humanity, the Earth system will be able to clean itself and balance out without any major negative consequences. However, because human beings have been there, we are there, we have been introduced into nature, our economic systems, part of it, uh, uh, which is actually accelerated through grid, uh, exploit exploiting more than what we need from the environment. We are now generating a lots of carbon dioxide, methane, nitrogen dioxide, and other greenhouse gases. So what happens? There's now a thicker layer of these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So as usual, there is radiation, solar radiation takes place, radiation from the sun, and the heat is reflected back from the Earth's surface. Unfortunately, a lot of it now is trapped because of this thick layer of the greenhouse gases that are there in the atmosphere, mainly because of, these are human-induced greenhouse gases. When that happens, we now witness the phenomenon or concept of of global warming, and when that takes place, it destabilizes the entire atmospheric circulation and earth circulation system. Then when that happens, literally the earth then re reacts, the system reacts. And when the system reacts, 
we start seeing all these impacts from the changing climate. Some of the impacts, like I said earlier on, hailstorms, droughts, floods, it is saying, I usually want to call this tantrums, it's the earth throwing tantrums, because we have also thrown something at it that it cannot accommodate, then it reflects, it reacts by these weather extremes. So to just conclude on this uh, preliminary explanation, I am saying, we start with the greenhouse effect. From the greenhouse effect, we have uh, the trapping of the greenhouse uh, gases by the atmosphere. Most of this human induced and or anthropogenic greenhouse gases. Then when that happens, there is global warming. After global warming, there is climate change. And the results of climate change are those extreme weather events. And all this is coming from our emitting of the harmful greenhouse gases. This is why we are saying enough is enough. It's time for us as a world, as a continent, to start addressing our behavior and our habits in terms of emitting greenhouse gases. And as usual, there's a small activity there, 3.38 minutes uh, video that are going to be looking, which speaks about the need to align policies for a low carbon economy. You will uh, get into your uh, PowerPoint that is loaded on the platform and you can click the link there and you should be able to enjoy this small clip like I did. Now, we continue with our concept in terms of low carbon space. Nations have pledged to walk through the transition pathway to protect the current and the future generations from the impact of climate change. Remember, we talk about the current and future generations in our first module. Under the Paris Agreement, commitments were made to transform national development trajectories, focusing on limiting global warming by 2100 to 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The current efforts are important, but not sufficient to keep the warming of the globe below 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Hence, there is a need for humanity to embark on a low carbon, just and sustainability transition pathway. Now, when I say humanity, I also include you, the participant, our guest who is listening to this recording, you and I are part of this global system and we need to act. It remains a jungle regarding the concepts and terms in use in the space uh, uh, we are deliberating on. And I'm just mentioning some here that we'll cover. We won't be able to cover all in this uh, recording, but I think uh, your extra readings and also your own research will assist you in understanding some of these issues. So we are going to possibly look at terms like carbon neutrality, net zero, a term spelled with the Y as one word with the capital letter N and Z, or net zero emissions, and also net zero time spelled with as two words. It depends on, on your orientation. It's too okay. Carbon negative, low emissions, low carbon, zero emissions, positive carbon, green economy, circular economy, decarbonization. You can, there, are many, there are many concepts that are climate resilient development. So all these are terminologies that are used within the low carbon space. However, what is critical is that using the correct terminology can make the difference between actual climate action and greenwashing. Usually we say corporate greenwashing. And I hope in this course, after this course, we will be able to also pinpoint where there's greenwashing or corporate greenwashing and where there is genuine climate action. So what we need basically is genuine climate action. And I, I want to highlight that even though at times uh, 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 corporates are seen as not willing to engage in the low carbon economy, I think that time from what I'm witnessing is gone. That time is passed. Apart from making a lot of profit by just being green or going low carbon, the corporate world has realized that if they are not involved, then we can all go down. It's not one person or one entity, one country going down. It's the entire world that can go down if we don't address these issues of the low carbon transition and just transition. Let me move on to carbon neutrality as a concept. Carbon neutrality refers to the balance between 
the entities or organizing carbon emissions and that entity's carbon absorption or the manner in which it can sink or sequestrate this carbon. So the amount of carbon emissions at least in the atmosphere by an organization remain the same as the amount of carbon emissions that it sequestrates uh, uh, from the atmosphere, the sinks. The carbon neutral protocol is another issue uh, that we can we want to consider. There's also what we call the greenhouse protocol. You should be able to uh, 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 search that uh, on Google and, and retrieve it. Uh, I think the last time I checked, it was free online. The process of assessing the carbon footprint and reducing it to a neutral or obtained certification is known as the carbon neutral protocol. And of course, you can also apply methodologies from the greenhouse gas protocol. It was first uh, designed in 2002 and updated. It's updated annually to reflect developments in the climate science, international policy, standards, and business practices. The protocol comprises five steps, including the need to define, measure, set targets or target, reduce, and do communi good communication. Now, what is interesting is in real life, we can actually reduce all our carbon emissions to just one number. I won't be having time to get into how we are going to be calculating the carbon footprint, but I can even calculate the carbon footprint of my presenting this lecture to you, of which it will include virtual presentation. Under normal circumstances, maybe we would go to Dakar in Senegal uh, at IDEP, then we'll be there, everybody flying in and out, and you can imagine the amount of carbon that will be emitted. I know some of our participants there, they'll say, ah, Professor Namo, we have lost our PDMs because we are not traveling. We have lost this and that because we are not traveling. Yes, we need to travel, but I say we still need to, be, to do it responsibly under these circumstances of the high carbon emissions. I also wish to travel, and get that per diem, but I am coming to a point whereby I have realized it's important at times to go virtual. Now, when you are defining, uh, what, what do you mean when you're defining uh, where you want to go in terms of carbon footprint? You are saying an entity must clearly define the components of a project, processes and activities that are targeted to attain carbon neutrality. So you are saying you, you need to define your boundaries. You need to set your boundaries. By setting your boundaries, um, uh, I want to give an example of, say, one of the controversial issues in South Africa was NetBank when they declared carbon neutrality some many years ago. And the argument was NetBank, you have uh, deliberately excluded some of, some of your or, 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 or entities or influence, where you've got influence. For example, NetBank would have used possibly its own um, uh, facilities that they own, but there are also facilities that they rent. And what about the, the cause effect of you having your employees driving to work every day and other issues? And all those uh, um, uh, emissions were not included. It, it draws us back to the scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. So a lot of scope three emissions would have been excluded in the, in the, defi in the definition of the boundaries. The legal and physical boundaries must be clarified and the duration of certification need also to be defined as well. So three categories for uh, carbon neutrality exist and these are namely entity neutrality, we're talking about organizations including companies and public sector bodies, household individuals and subdivisions of this. Then there's also what you call product in, uh, carbon neutrality, uh, articles, substances, uh, capital assets manufactured or refined, and there's what we call activity process neutrality, actions performed to achieve uh, targeted outputs. You can read this on your own. Uh, on your, on your. Measure. Measuring involves, this involves measuring the entity's carbon emissions or greenhouse gas uh, emissions quantified as equivalent of carbon dioxide as I alluded to earlier in module one under the global warming potential. A complete and accurate inventory of the uh, greenhouse gas, uh, gases is provided over a specific, uh, specified time scale. And usually it's, it's 12 months, uh, depending on whether you want to have them as the normal uh, calendar year, year, uh, year, January to December, 
or you want to have them as an accounting year, February, uh, 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 February to March in South Africa for companies or whatever, but it should actually cover uh, uh, 12 months. And usually when you are trying to measure, you must identify a base year. The emissions are assessed according to the requirements set out for entities, products, and activities. And of course, that greenhouse uh, uh, gas protocol and also the standards, the ISO standards also on greenhouse gas emissions come in. And you might even want to go on the verification and validation of your carbon uh, 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 footprint uh, and if especially want to go uh, into carbon trading. The entity, uh, in terms of target, the entity needs to set a con uh, and confirm its greenhouse gas emission neutrality target. So in this case, uh, you might say by 2030. And in this case, our global entity, the universe, have said, we want to be carbon uh, net zero by 2050. That's our target. And this target is to be delivered uh, mainly through in-house uh, greenhouse gases, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, apartment strategy, as far as possible. I'm back to the, to the entity now. So I'm saying if a company has set a, a carbon neutrality by a certain period, you need then to institute internal measures that can result in you achieving that. So let's take, for example, the way I, I am working at the University of South Africa. Then you are saying the university must put in place measures. And in, in, in real practice, we have put in place the uh, solar installations. We are talking about energy efficiency. Uh, we are talking about water efficiency. These are actually the measures that we have practically put in place. We're talking about water harvesting. These are actually real uh, projects that we have put in place in the university. Then when that is failed, then you can also do what we call offsetting. You go outside your organization and do that. So I think when all those things have done, there is no way, unless if you are in another industry, like maybe the plant agricultural sector, plantation sector or something of that sort, where you can, you can have a, a, a carbon negative uh, uh, number. We'll talk about carbon negative later. Reduce. So in terms of reducing, this involves implementing carbon apartment strategies within the entity to achieve carbon neutrality based on the scope of emissions. And as a matter of recapping, we said scope one, carbon emissions cover direct emissions from owned or controlled sources. I said, you can put a cover over my house that all the emissions covered uh, being trapped as scope one. Scope two, carbon emissions cover the indirect emissions from the generation of purchased electricity, purchased steam, Purchase the heating and cooling consumed by the reporting company. And scope three, carbon em emissions include all other indirect emissions that occur in the company's organization's value chain. Now, this is important. The idea of a value chain and the uh, low carbon transition is critical. Because as far as we know, um, if uh, you are, for example, from an entity that is in supply chain, the main contractor is going to force you to, be, to, to reduce your carbon footprint. Communication or communicate. In communicating, I'm saying the entities must communicate their carbon neutrality journey based on facts and in a clear, consistent, and transparent manner. And now, when you hear those terminologies, clear, consistent, and transparent, these are all accounting terms. So, in accounts, we are trying to be clear, we are trying to be consistent, we are trying to be uh, uh, transparent, both management and financial accounting. Now, in greenhouse gas uh, inventory metrics relating to the entity certification should also be publicly disclosed. So you can't just uh, uh, say, I, I am carbon neutral, and you, you hide it under a bushel. No. We need to know. You need to communicate to your stakeholders, uh, shareholders, and other entities interested to say, this is what we have decided. We are going to go carbon neutral, and this is our journey. Now, in terms of reporting uh, options, we also need to have on uh, communication and third party communication. Now, let me move on to carbon negative. Carbon negative is when a system removes greenhouse gases from the atmosphere more than it emits. Now, there, there are a number of uh, situations like this, uh, but they are, of course, rare as well. An entity is said to be carbon negative when its impact on the atmosphere is positive, meaning that it is doing something to reduce climate change and of course, reduce global warming and effectively climate change. Many plantations and plant-based entities like nurseries are usually carbon negative. Therefore, it is important to note that the safe level of carbon 
in the atmosphere. I'm not talking about the global safety level. Was stated 330 uh, uh, parts per million. This is actually a scientific term. 330 parts per million, which was surpassed way back in 1987. So this just it gives you why we're talking about carbon negative, carbon neutrality, because the, 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 the world already, we have actually surpassed our carbon budget in terms of parts per million in the atmosphere. Zero emissions is another concept. This just means no emissions at all. However, no technology produces zero emissions. And there are contestations on this. For example, we have heard of zero emissions electric vehicles. But this cannot be because even the most climate smart technology, such as a zero emitting electric vehicles, produces what we call we know as inherent or embedded emissions. These are emissions that are created in manufacturing of that technology or that particular car. So there might be zero ongoing emissions from use. But actually, when you are manufacturing that, you can say it is zero emissions. Now, net zero or net zero emissions, what does it imply? In general terms, net zero is almost similar or the same as carbon neutral, in the sense that emissions are still being generated, but they are offset by the same amount elsewhere. So the net total of an entity's emissions becomes zero. So here what we are saying, when we talk about net zero globally, we are saying the emissions we emit as a world should actually be equivalent to the emissions that we are taking out from the world or from the globe. Technologies play a big part in net zero. And for example, if a process generates carbon dioxide, but also captures it and stores it, it can be net zero. A coal-fired power plant, we have got so many of these, that is fitted with carbon capture and carbon storage technology may also move towards net zero. Remember that I'm using the term may also move towards net zero because this might not be practical. And this is a reason why we talk about the just transition because they are, we are going to reach a point where most of these coal-fired power stations in Africa and elsewhere are going to be shut down. Uh, I'm not trying to scare you, but this is a reality that is coming. We will witness almost zero uh, coal-fired power plants by 2050. Most national and international climate goals are aiming for net zero by either 2030, these are actually some of the countries, or 2050. And as a continent, we must take note of this critical trajectory. By taking note and saying, there could be other countries that are still hoping that maybe the net zero is just going to fly away and we can continue our life or business as usual. That is not going to happen because the terrain has shifted. What about low emissions or low carbon? Sustainability experts have recommended the non-use uh, or uh, to refrain from using the term low emissions or low carbon because this uh, terminology is remain difficult to qualify. How much is low? And when you're moving from high to low, by how much, what is the target? So there's ambiguity there. This is why the sustainability experts, climate experts and other stakeholders um, encourage avoiding use the, using the terms low emissions or low carbon. However, low carbon usually means the carbon uh, emissions released by an entity are lower than those produced under business as usual conditions or scenario. So at least there's a positive move regardless of that negativity in terms of its ambiguous. So however, this leaves a lot of gaps in information. Like I said, how much is less? What is business as usual? What is the entity comparing it to? Is it, it's, con, it's a confused, confusing term. And of course, best avoid this one. Carbon positive or climate positive. It's another terminology that we talk about in just and low carbon transition. This term is mostly used in non-scientific circles and usually in marketing products and services. Some companies have used these terms to describe their efforts to reduce emissions, both and slightly confusing terms as well. These are used to talk about what scientists would call carbon negative. Just a bit about uh, some of the terminologies that uh, you want to learn. Decarbonization, there's a lot of debate that's going on there. And I want to also leave you 
with that homework that uh, can you try and untangle that development, decarbonization. I want to move on to the section that's talking about the just and sustainability transitions, focusing on the concepts and other consultations. We start with uh, an interesting activity, 5.33 minutes uh, clip. This is actually a clip I did with uh, the South African uh, Broadcasting uh, Corporation, I think it was SABC3 news uh, uh, channel. And I was just giving a highlight in terms of a book that it published uh, in 2014 called Land Grabs in a Green African Economy. It's an edited book. But I think uh, what came clearly in this book is Africa needed to be on its toes. We need to be um, uh, alert and aware of some of the challenges that this low carbon transition brings. Because there are entities that are moving from all over the world, coming and grabbing our forests, coming and uh, uh, instituting uh, um, uh, um, biofuels uh, plants, some of which we may not even use in our continent. And we are saying we need to be aware of this because there are also negatives in terms of how this low carbon uh, economy trajectory pans out. Enjoy watching that small clip. Now, the severity of climate change necessitates deep and rapid changes to economic activity and society and business as usual approaches will not be sufficient. However, there is no single universally acceptable definition of what just transition, even sustainability transition means. It is however important to establish core fundamentals or principles and understand the range of definitions among stakeholders and their underlying perspectives. Here we present a framework to outline the varying definitions and illustrate where approaches, ideologies, and priorities align and diverge. So when you talk about the just transition, there's one element that you can put on a graph on the vertical um, uh, axis and say social inclusion. It's one of the key issues and the levels of social inclusion. Then there is also issues around the scope on our natural uh, or axis. You can actually see this in your PowerPoint. So they were talking about things like uh, procedural justice, empowerment. They were also talking about participation. We are talking about distributional effects. We're also talking about uh, expansive effects. You can maybe see that graph in your uh, PowerPoint. Now, the social inclusion dimension remains central or pivotal in just transition and refers to procedural inclusion in the process of achieving just sustainability and uh, just transition and as such, it captures both recognition and procedural justice. The spectrum of social inclusion reflects in part the number and types of groups included, as well as the frequency of their inclusion. And social inclusion implies the representation of groups that are vulnerable to the impacts in the context of transition. For example, co-workers. We can also include the people working in the refineries. We can include indigenous communities. We can in include communities that are um, being uh, removed forcibly from biofuel plantations. Similarly, communities that are removed when uh, uh, instituting hydropower plants, wind farms, solar projects, all these are communities that we need to look at. Why we are saying about this, these are the issues that are going to come or that are already happening on the continent as we speak about the just and sustainability transition and net zero. We will scale up investments in renewable energy and that require land. We will close power plants, uh, coal-fired power plants, and that requires justice in terms of the workers that are there. Now, procedural justice also implies meaningful participation, including that of uniquely um, vulnerable populations and marginalized groups. We will see a nice chart in your notes that is actually giving us the spectrums of the scope and social inclusion and just transitions. Now, we also need to talk about the stakeholders and their roles when we're talking about just tran and sustainability transitions. So the just and sustainability transition requires stakeholders to work together to determine the future of communities and individuals, especially as low carbon transition and forward on the continent. Workers and employers are the core social partners. And of course, then they are mandated to make decisions 
that result in the sustainability of current action or decisions. Unions, union and union federations or workers organizations, they also represent workers and their interests at different levels should be realized. So we cannot just uh, escape uh, talking about the roles of the key stakeholders or partners in the just and sustainability transition. Now, for enterprises or organizations, what do they need to do? There is a need to agree on concrete time bound and enterprise wide plans for emissions cuts. So we can just, uh, as, a, as, a, as a CEO or as government or another person, just drop a target to say by 2025, we need you to be uh, carbon neutral or net zero. That cannot happen. So I'm saying that the enterprise need actually to agree. So while creating decent jobs, we need also to reskill and also need to retain workers so that at least there is no suffering of our communities. This is going to be a major issue in terms of the just and uh, sustainability transition. The other major issue is also around um, uh, uh, stranded assets. As we abandon these coal mines, these are assets. What about stranded human resources? as we abandon these mines and other uh, carbon heavy industries. These are issues that we need to look at seriously. And for example, in Africa, we have these resources in abundance. What does the just transition mean? Are we just going to abandon these resources like that? So these are also bigger questions that are going to be uh, floated as the net zero debate rages on. Now, for sectors, there is a need to promote strong climate, labor, and just transition targets policies and supportive lobby positions and to invest in uh, pre-competitive sectoral collaboration. And of course, on, at regional and national levels, there's a need to play an active role in the formulation and implementation of strong climate, just transition, labor markets and social protection policies. Because uh, the, the governments, they are there to establish policies. And of course, the public investments need to be done in green and decent jobs uh, creation. So these are also some of the responsibilities that we put in there. Now allow me to move to the next section that is talking about uh, low carbon development with a focus towards net zero. There's an interesting activity there on net zero transitions, uh, energy transition in net zero. And uh, we have got two small uh, clips, uh, video clips. The first one you will uh, uh, view is on energy transition in emerging economies. Uh, it's less than five minutes. And another video, the second video is the one for from the International Energy Agency on net zero by 2050 roadmap. We have uh, drawn uh, significant material from this um, I, I, uh, International Energy Agency document. What do we mean by a net zero or towards net zero? So the number of countries pledging to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 or earlier is increasing. However, the emissions of greenhouse gases continue to increase as well, reflecting a gap between rhetoric and action. This needs to be addressed if we are to have a significant chance of reaching net zero by 2050 and limiting the rise in global temperatures to 1.5 degrees Celsius. This requires total transformation of the energy systems or energy sector that underpins our economy. Now let's talk there about this, uh, the clean energy. Net zero by 2050 hinges on an unprecedented clean technology push by 2030. So I think before 2030, starting now, we really need to have an unprecedented clean technology push. So the science-based observations say, say, uh, say to us, the path to net zero emission is narrow. Staying on it requires immediate and massive deployment of all available clean and efficient energy technologies. If a cheaper renewable energy technologies give electricity the age in the race to zero. Now, the race to zero there is, um, is not a race between countries, although you could, Think of it as a race between countries. It's a race against time. So the race to zero, when we hear race to zero, don't think of your country and the next. When I talk about the race to zero, we are saying we are racing against time. Time is run out for us to go to zero. 
So we are on the race against time. So what are some of the priority actions? We need to make the 2020s, these are the 2020s, this decade of the 2020s, uh, we need to make it a massive clean energy expansion. All the technologies needed to achieve the necessary deep cuts in global emissions by 2030 already exist. And the policies that can drive their development are already proven. Again, we uh, need also to have a huge loop or leapfrogging in clean energy innovation. So what does the science say about this leap in clean energy innovation? Reaching the net zero by 2050 requires further rapid deployment of available technologies, as well as widespread use of technologies that are not on the market now or as yet. And the biggest innovation opportunities concern advanced batteries, hydrogen, electro, uh, hydrogen electrolyzers, and direct air capture and storage. So these are actually the biggest innovations that are in the horizon towards 2050. And the priority action, we need to prepare for the next phase of the transition by boosting innovation. Clean energy innovation must accelerate rapidly with governments putting research and development demonstration, uh, research and development demonstration and deployment at the core of energy and climate policies. Another issue in terms of transition to net zero is for and about people. We can't leave people behind. So the science-based observation says a transition of the scale and speed described by the net zero pathway cannot be achieved without sustained support and participation from citizens. Providing electricity to around 785 million people that have no access and clean cooking solutions to 2.6 billion people that lack those options is an integral part of the pathway to net zero. Some of the challenges brought by the clean energy transformation may be challenging to implement, so decisions must be transparent, just, and cost-effective. Now, when we talk about clean um, energy there and also access to electricity, we are being directed back to SDG 7, like I ind indicated earlier. And we are saying that, for example, on our continent, we still have massive uh, uh, populations that don't have access to electricity. And that has resulted in serious environmental degradation, especially deforestation. And with our photosynthesis story, then we are emitting more into the atmosphere due to uh, 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 deforestation. We also cut trees or distant when you're uh, cutting for more agricultural land. So all these now become matters of concern when you talk about net zero. Now, what, about, what are the priority actions regarding or surrounding people and net zero? Clean energy jobs will grow strongly, but must be spread widely. Actually, the International Energy Agency is talking about 5 million jobs that are going to be lost and 30 million jobs that are going to be created globally. So we might have a net effect of the net zero giving us about 25 million jobs globally. So this indeed becomes a good thing if it can be realized. So it's conditional. It's not, it's not something that can just come. It's conditional. Energy transition, you have to take account of the social and economic impacts on individuals and communities and treat people as active participants. By the way, we plan for people. We don't plan for, for the animals. The animals are part of a, a human a fiber. So as we are planning net zero, we should put humanity at the center. I net zero. So the science observation says in the net zero pathway, global energy demand in 2050 is around 8%, smaller than today. But it saves an economy more than twice as big population with 2 billion more people. Instead of fossil fuels, the energy sector is based largely on renewable sector, uh, energy. Therefore, net zero means a huge decline in the use of fossil fuels. Electricity accounts for almost 50% of total energy consumption in 2050, and emissions from industry, transport, and buildings take longer to reduce. This we need to note. Therefore, cutting industry emissions by 95% by 2050 involves major efforts to build new infrastructure. So our priority action there is to set near-term milestones to get on track for long-term targets. 
Governments need to provide credible step-by-step -step plans to reach their net zero goals, building confidence among investors, building confidence among citizens, industry, and other countries as well in terms of partnerships. I cannot stop by thinking of the Inga uh, opportunities. I'm not talking about the DRC. We have got a huge potential there. We have in the SADC region, we've been talking about the Southern African power pool for years. And I hope this net zero push is going also to push us as a continent to engage in these win-win-win scenarios. I have put three wins there rather than the normal win-win. So net zero might actually push us into that win-win-win situation. Another point, there is no need for investment in new fossil fuel supply in our net zero pathway. Now by 2050, be, the science says beyond projects already committed as of 2021, there are no new oil and gas fuels approved for development in our pathway. And no new coal, coal mines, neither do we have a new mine extensions required. Clean electricity generation, network infrastructure, and end use sectors are key areas for increased investment. And of course, we are going to hit a neg here because a lot of investment then would involve uh, key players like the World Bank. I don't have anything against the World Bank, but I know that a loan from the World Bank can impoverish your nation. So we really need to think twice before we go to the loan. If it is not a grant or a concession, we may not then need to take it on board. We may need to strongly think of mobilizing resources domestically which is part of the 23rd Agenda for Sustainable Development, as outlined in the Addis Ababa Agenda uh, on, on, on financing. What are the priority actions then? We need to drive a holistic surge in clean energy investment. Policies need to be designed to send market good market signals that unlock new businesses model or business models and mobilize private spending, especially in emerging economies. A wrong policy signal is dangerous for the market, and we cannot operate in a world outside the market. I can give you an example. If your country does not have a good policy on uh, renewable energy feed, uh, feed in tariffs, you can lose to the neighbor. We have just put that in place. So we need to be careful in terms of that. Another point, I'm moving on. Is an unparalleled clean energy investment boom lifts global economic growth. These are scenarios that are coming from the International Energy Agency. What does the science say? The science says total annual energy investment surges to 5 trillion US dollars are expected by 2030, adding an extra 0.5 percentage point a year to annual global GDP. Based on our joint analysis, uh, in, uh, 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 with, uh, based on the joint analysis by the International Energy Agents and the International Monetary Fund. Now, governments have a key role in enabling investment-led growth and ensuring that the benefits are shared by all. Then what is the priority action that is being proposed by the International Energy Agents and other stakeholders? We need to invest in more clean energy at all levels, including individual, organizational and the national levels. And another point they were talking about the uh, net zero pathway, new energy security concerns emerge, and of course, old ones remain. What is the science observ uh, observation in terms of this? The contraction of oil and natural gas production will have far reaching implications for all the countries and companies that produce these fuels. We're talking about uh, uh, BP, we're talking about uh, uh, other Ox Oxymobile and other companies. But I want to say, we are still discovering oil fields in Africa. And we've got major economies like Nigeria and other Northern African countries that uh, produce oil. And we are saying here, we need to relook at our economies. Diversification has to be uh, the priority now for economies like Nigeria. Because when you go to net zero, what is going to happen? That oil revenue can drastically drop to uh, by possibly 70 to 
So possibly by 2050, we'll only be having 20% of revenue generated in that sector. Whereas maybe uh, it was quite a huge uh, uh, contribution to the economy. So applies to Middle East economies, uh, talking about Saudi Arabia, uh, Kuwait, all these oil producing uh, economies, OPEC members, Angola in Southern Africa. These are the issues that we really need to think and rethink and plan accordingly. Why? Because if you plan, if you if you don't plan, we are planning to fail. I said it. If you don't have a vision, we will perish. Therefore, the energy transition requires substantial quantities of critical minerals, and I've added the copper included. I remember the economies of Zambia that were a laughing stock in yesteryear because copper lost value. Time has come now for you to set a business that's going to look at copper and other minerals that are needed uh, in the scenario to 2050. And of course, their supply emerges as a significant growth area. The rapid electrification of all sectors makes electricity even more central to energy security around the world than it is today. So what are some of the priority actions that the international energy agents put on the table? They said we need to address emerging energy security risks now by ensuring an interrupted and reliable supplies of energy and critical energy-related commodities at affordable prices will only rise in importance on the way to net zero. So what I'm simply saying there is government worker, as a journalist, as a, as a, as a, as a uh, uh, member of the uh, CPO or NGO, there are messages that we need to bring to society. And there are messages even of uh, opening up new business ventures that the net zero is going to bring. The, 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 the wave is coming, the tide has turned, and the net zero is going to have some opportunities. Yes, there are going to be some risks, as I was highlighting, in terms of the just transition, but there are also opportunities that we can pick along the way uh, as we move towards the net uh, zero issue. I want to just uh, pause here by saying, do you know how long it takes to put a, a grid, to bring a grid to your area? It can take between five to 10 years. So when I'm talking about electricity being central, that electricity, we talk of both on-grid and off-grid. I don't think we're going to do away with on-grid electricity now, although we're also talking a lot around small grids, which are all off-grids as well and small grids. So all these are going to be in the play. For on-grid solutions, the government needs to start investing now to build energy transition systems so that by the time net zero comes, everything is happening. Another point we are talking about is the international cooperation is pivotal for achieving net zero emissions by 2050. So the science-based observations say making net zero emissions a reality hinges on a singular and wavering focus from all governments working together with one another and with businesses, investors, and citizens. Underpinning all these changes are policy decisions made by government. Changes in energy consumption result in a significant decline in fossil fuel tax revenue. The net zero pathway relies on unprecedented international cooperation among governments, especially on innovation and investment. So what are some of the priority areas that are being proposed? Take international cooperation to new heights. And this is actually under SDG 17. We're talking about partnerships. And of course, remember I spoke about the win-win-win scenario. We don't want a situation where there's a big brother or a developing nation is considered a child out of the wedlock or a second-class uh, economy. We want a genuine partnership so that uh, uh, net zero can be, a, 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 can be beneficial to every global citizen. Citizen. We also need to be tackling global challenges through coordinated efforts. Now, there are a number of uh, graphs that we've put in your PowerPoints that are talking about the scenario now, where are we in 2020, where we could say uh, 40 metric uh, 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 tons of CO2 uh, 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 captured and uh, maybe 5% of global car sales being uh, electrical. Then I was talking about um, uh, uh, from 2021, uh, uh, no new unabated core plans approved for development. You can look at that. 
Then there's a scenario that has been presented by the International Energy Agents for 2030. What will be required there by 2030? Uh, universal energy access is going to be there. All new buildings are zero carbon ready. And 60% of global car sales are electric. Now, this is serious. When I talk about 2030 uh, uh, colleagues and participants and fellow African citizens, global citizens, we know people like their Mercedes Benz, they like their BMWs, they like their Bentleys and all these other cars that are uh, powered by combustion engine. By 2030, we will be using these cars to raise our chickens because nobody will be needing them. And as a matter of fact, they won't be produced anymore. So this is actually a serious issue for Africa. So if you're not going to leapfrog and catch on to the bandwagon of net zero, I'm not in marketing. I'm just talking as a concerned global citizen. We are going to have serious challenges. So we really need to talk about these issues and see that things are happening. The electric cars uh, uh, movement or wave is picking up. And I am sure by 2030, 60% of these global cars will be electrical. We're also talking about uh, uh, most of the new clean technologies in health industries that are demos, uh, that would have been scaled, scaled up. And by 2035, there are also issues that are coming there again. No new internal combustion engine car sales. This is what actually the International Energy Agents and other partners are, are, are projecting or proposing to say by 2035, we will not be having any new combustion engine car sales. So there will be zero combustion engine uh, car sales. Now, 2035, by the way, is 15 years from now. And 15 years is not a lot of time. And also talk about 50% of heavy truck sales being electric. Talk about buses, all this uh, truck trucking industry, also moving strongly towards being elect uh, electric vehicles. Overall net zero emissions, uh, in electricity in advanced economies is expected. So you can also read on your own and enjoy. By 2040, there are other issues also that are raised in there. Oil demand is 50% of 2020 levels. Those are some of the issues that are being uh, raised in there. And of course, by 2050, there is a lot that will have been there. More than 90% of every industrial production is low emissions. Renewable, uh, renewables reach almost 90% of total electricity generation. We are talking about global electricity generation. And if you are saying 90% of global electricity generation is from renewables, this is a serious movement. Almost 70% of electricity generated generation globally from solar PV and wind. Then about 7.6 gigatons of carbon captured. Now, this is a serious proposal. And this requires action. This is why the host of the COP26 this year, uh, uh, United Kingdom in, in, in Glasgow, is talking about this 2050. And a lot of countries have hooked up and they now believe in net zero. I want now to move to the next section. That's talking about the energy sector. I've touched on the energy sector, uh, as I was explaining. But we are just trying to enhance it in this presentation by saying it is a battle zone towards 2050. There's an activity there that we'll get. It's exactly 1.43 minutes. What is net zero? You can watch that. Uh, it can enhance what I've been talking about. The global energy landscape is undergoing a major transformation. However, the energy sector is still currently dominated by fossil fuels, like I said, and transition to low carbon fuels will generate a myriad of stranded assets, skills, and technologies. There is a race towards innovation, skills, and technological modification, modification to ensure rele relevance in the event of total transformation of the energy sector. A lot has so far changed in the energy sector in Africa, but the continent is still lagging behind in terms of harnessing renewable energy technologies and providing access to energy to its population. I don't understand why countries in Europe, where they, 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 they thank God for a sunshine day, uh, are ahead in terms of renewables, solar especially. And where in Africa, we don't know what to do with the solar. We are behind. 
really there, of course, there are other bottlenecks in terms of technology deployment and transfer IT, but it's time that we wake up as a continent and push this agenda as much as we can. I just want to, there were a number of uh, uh, headlines that I picked and put them in one uh, slide. You see them in your PowerPoint. This one has been uh, being flooded in South African media under News 24, it's an online media channel. And I just clipped, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, did some clips in terms of the interesting aspects or development that are taking place. Uh, so I'll read you some of the uh, uh, titles, uh, the news, you know, the head headlines uh, that are captured by the journalists. So the first one was, Total changes its name and logo. So we're talking about Total, the company. When you change your name and logo, you, it, you mean business. So after all those years, Total has changed its name and logo. And it's now being called Total Energies. This is a reflection of that net zero is on its way. Gold fields to build a 600 rand million solar plant. Uh, and we are talking about the, uh, the size of that plant is about 200 soccer fields together. This is gold with the mining company in South Africa. Uh, 660 million land, the current exchange rate is about 14 rand 90 as of today. Uh, Johannesburg, city of Johannesburg wants companies to build solar plants and then it will buy that energy. ESCOM needs over 140 billion rand to repurpose, to repurpose most of its coal plants by 2050. Why 2050? It's net zero. You know ESCOM, it even supplies Africa. That's a huge energy utility for those that know it. To repurpose its solar plants by 2050. South Africa's uh, first electric buses take on the streets in Cape Town. This is happening. Then I'm talking about the, um, uh, the interesting uh, uh, part, the BP, BHP, Bilton, BHP quits oil and piles into potash in overhaul. So things are happening there. Then there also is around Sasol. Sasol is the, 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 the synthetic uh, uh, company in South Africa. Ice 900 megawatt of renewable energy uh, from independent sources. Then, of course, there's also other title. British Airways invite passengers to pay for green fuel. Hyundai, the company we all know, to spend, uh, um, uh, to speed up hydrogen car rollout. So we are now going also to see um, hydrogen uh, powered cars. Hyundai, one of the uh, major manufacturers there. Toyota to spend $13.6 billion on electricity car batteries by 2030. So, uh, dear participants, things are happening. And at last heading, you might over two of them. Space, the football club in 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 in, in UK, staged uh, the world's first net zero carbon match. So even in the sporting fields, we are talking about net zero. And lastly, the first round is a major bank here uh, in, in in South Africa and also across the country or the continent. Uh, the first round will no longer finance new coal fire powered stations. So um, colleagues, when you're talking about net zero, uh, these are issues that are happening. And I've just decided to give you some of the headlines in the media last week and some uh, maybe this month uh, in South Africa. And this actually is what is happening. So we continue moving and the net zero space is, is going to be something uh, interesting. We also talk about grid emission factors and on the continent, the more coal-fired power uh, uh, plants you have, the higher your grid emission factor and it will impact on your uh, carbon footprint. Now I'm moving to the last section on what is in it for Africa. This net zero thing and low carbon transition. There is a, a small clip there, less than three minutes, 2.26 minutes. Uh, we talk about climate smart mining. You can watch that. And, and enjoy. Now, energy is the key uh, to development in Africa or on our continent and the foundation for industrialization. No continent, no nation does not need industrialization. However, more than 46% of the population still has got no access to electricity. And African leaders have made clear their commitments to attain inclusive and sustainable economic growth and development in, their, in our 2030 agenda. 2063 agenda. This provides hope 
that the African continent can address fundamental challenges of energy access, energy security, and climate change, and of course, including our forests. Now, what we need to do here is Africa is arguably the largest renewable energy resources of, uh, of, uh, of any continent. Sunlight is abundantly available everywhere. Other types of resources are more plentiful in some countries than others and regions than others. For example, geothermal along the Rift Valley of East Africa, wind power along the Horn of Africa, and other coastal areas. Africa's theoretical potential to generate onshore renewable energy from existing technologies is more than 1,000 times larger than its projected 2040 demand for electricity. So what are we waiting for? We need to promote renewable energy access. And we need to do uh, mini grids. We need to be off grid. These are actually the realities that are there. We also need to de-risk and promote private sector investment. The investments required to meet Africa's growing demand for renewable energy are far greater than the funds available from public sources. And by building stable, predictable enabling frameworks, identifying a pipeline of viable projects or bankable projects and offering targeted de-risking instruments, African governments and their development partners can facilitate the private sector investment uh, necessary to bridge this gap. Now, you discover that we need to actually to, 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 to strengthen and modernize our grid. Many African countries have inadequate grid infrastructure. This cannot be overemphasized and designed to accommodate conventional energy sources resulting in high electricity losses and low supply quality, among other issues. This is also a barrier to introducing and upscaling or scaling up intensive, uh, uh, inexpensive viable renewable energy. What we know, the cost of renewable has been going down drastically. I think in some few years, it's going even to go far much cheaper than the cost of doing it from coal. For Africa to harness the potential of energy, renewable energy, a systems approach is required. Innovative power generation technologies such as renewable power systems combined, uh, combining two or more technologies for example, floating solar, uh, photovoltaic, and pumped hydro storage, as well as off-grid renewable energy systems, combined with innovative enabling technologies such as green hydrogen, Internet of Things, and renewable energy mini grids are all needed. New business models, improved regulatory frameworks, and system operating procedures should also be adopted. And I want to conclude this section and also this module by just uh, recapping on how do we need to deal with stranded carbon intensive assets. The greater challenge in low carbon transition and net zero in Africa leads to huge carbon intensive assets like coal mines, crude oil, agriculture, and other. In addition, we have human resources in this carbon intensive industry that are also going to be stranded as we move to net zero. But the good thing like the International Energy Agency predicts, there is going to be a net benefit of about 25 million jobs globally by moving to net, net zero by 2050. I hope you have enjoyed this recording like I did. And I'm also hoping that it's not going to be like another course, you get your certificate, a talk show. I hope we are going to be a game changer. We are going to be a champion when it comes to net zero and explain it in a manner that is non-confrontational, explain it in a manner that is beneficial to global citizens and explain it in a manner that benefits your family. Thank you.